A crowded arena was home, where battle-hardened warriors would skate against those with unmatched grace and speed. It was a rough, tough boom time for the game of hockey. The big bad Bruins would raise Lord Stanley's ancient cup, not once, but twice. Though yet again, Montreal would show that they were still the team to beat. Philadelphia brought a new style to the ice, a rugged brand of hockey as never seen before. Perhaps the game lost some of its innocence. Strong and gifted players would fight for honor, and in the end, skill and finesse would rule the day. Records were set as new superstars came to the fore. The pace was faster, the puck flew harder, but the challenge was met as we watched in celebration. I think when I was four or five, my mother had bought a pair of secondhand skates for me, and there was a rink right across the street from where we lived, and uh, I went over there and tried to learn how to skate. The only skates that they could give me, I was about four years old, was a pair of old blades that, strictly the blade, not the tubes, and they looked like goaltender skates, and this is uh, what they gave me to skate, and I couldn't skate very well, but I could run on them. I remember looking at Eaton's catalog, and there were a pair of skates in there, Red Horner skates. The Red Horner was a, the big, tough defense from the Toronto Maple Leafs, and that was my favorite team. So I sent Eaton's catalog to get these skates. Remember using my brother, big brother's skates. I had two brothers, and uh, I'd have to put about three pair of wool socks on to, to get the skates on. My mother figured it out. You know, she took my brother's hand-me-down skates, which were too big, and so she put my, uh, my boots, my winter boots, and put the skates you know, on top of it, and then send me out, and uh, it worked. The early pair of skates were, were an old pair of tacks, and uh, they were about this long, and my foot was about this long. So we had to find a way to stuff the ends. I remember my dad putting um, these double runners on my shoes, and uh, strapping them on with their leather straps, and he pushed me out there. After you did that for three or four weeks or a month, and you start, we started to you know, say that we needed real skates, and then and kept bugging him because, you know, Bob skates were for sissies. Probably the furthest I can remember is, is uh, skating uh, with my two brothers, uh, pushing a chair on the ice. And uh, that's, I was probably three and a half years old uh, when I started. And I uh, just remember I did that for about a couple hours and then uh, let the chair go and, and started skating uh, on my own, so. My original dream was really not to make the NHL, but it was to play with the Marlies. Um, I mean, to play a Marley game on, on uh, Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, um, I mean, that, that was the ultimate goal for me. Steve Shutt played minor hockey in the Toronto Marlboro system. And when their top junior club practiced, Steve would watch the older players. I would watch them and I watch them shoot the puck and I would think to myself, wait a minute, I can almost shoot as hard as those guys now. Um, I can almost skate as fast as those guys. And so then that dream was just a little bit closer to a reality. And I think it right at midget, uh, midget or minor midget, uh, it, it hit me that, boy, I can become a hockey player. There's no doubt that junior hockey was, was much tougher than the NHL. If you could survive junior hockey, and all of the battles that went on there, uh, you could survive the NHL. And I got drafted by Montreal, and the first thing I said, oh, geez, um, what's, what's, what's going on here? You know, because at that time they had a pretty stacked team. And I says, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna make this the NHL, not with this team. 
The first two years when I spent a lot of time in the press box, I wasn't very philosophical about it. I hated it. And uh, I, I just kept thinking to myself, I've come this far and I'm going to be a failure. I'm not going to make the NHL. He sat in my area up in the broadcast booth and so on watching the games more than he was on the ice playing it. He was part of that group that teams call the Black Aces who are around at practice and uh, don't get to play very often. And I just made up my mind that um, there hadn't been one other hockey team that I, that I couldn't make, so I was going to make the Montreal Canadiens. His perseverance would pay off. In his third year, Steve would crack the mighty Montreal lineup for good, and hockey became fun again. Playing hockey was uh, added up to a good time to Steve Shutt. He enjoyed it. Uh, he, lo he looked as if he enjoyed it, and that's important. But that didn't, for a minute, take away from his intensity, the, you know, the dedication to winning. One of the things I used to say was that, uh, you know, you know all that, all that, that glass that's around the rink. Well, that glass wasn't, that wasn't to keep the pucks in. That glass was to keep everybody else out. Because that's when we were happiest, right there. Once we were on the ice. I mean, that was the happiest moments of our lives. He enjoyed to play and uh, actually doubled his, his output. He went from 15 to 30 to 45 to 60 goals over a four-year span. So he just kept rising uh, to the occasion and formed a tandem with Guy Lafleur that uh, pretty well unstoppable. Playing with Lafleur was a lot of pressure. This guy was just so good and so driven uh, that I knew that, that I had to be at the top of my game or else this guy was just going to leave me in the dust. Shuddy before a game, you know, would sort of look at Lafleur and say, I need you ready tonight. I need you ready, but not too ready. I don't want goals from you. I want rebounds. You give me a rebound and I'll put it away. Steve was a constant offensive threat who made goal scoring look easy. 1976 marked the first of four straight Stanley Cups for Steve Shutt and the mighty Montreal Canadiens. Gets that phrase, the garbage collectors. Hey, you know, these fellows that pick up the rebounds from the Lafleurs of life and then put it in the net. But he had a terrific sense of the game of hockey, uh, a terrific feel about how the game should be played, how it was being played. I think his intelligence was a very, very big part of Steve Shutt's game. I always thought that. The, the kind of thing that, that would separate Steve from the, the large majority of players around the net would be his ability to get his stick on the puck as, as the goalie was uh, sprawled on the ice and other players were poking and jabbing at it. He would calmly stand his ground and, and when the, the puck popped out, whether it was on the ice or a foot off the ice or two feet off the ice, would calmly reach out, get a blade of his stick on the puck, and, and put it in the net. His eye-hand coordina coordination was exceptional. I mean, he came up with a good shot, but um, he, he had a deft knack of taking pucks that were in the air and turning them into deflections. He was one of the best I've ever seen. And I've not seen a guy that quick. and. Uh, that's why it gives you nightmares, is because it's that element of surprise and the ability that he has to knock stuff out of the air that no one else can do. Stevie Shutt was, uh, was the type of player you had to make sure you knew where he was all the time. He was the type of guy that, uh, you know, in your zone, you would never really be able to pick him up. Uh, you wouldn't realize it until after the puck was in your net and you'd look around, it was Stevie Shutt that scored on you. And he had a great shot, unbelievable shot. He'd come across the blue line, he could tee it up better than anybody. And, and he was accurate, which, which is scary for somebody with a slap shot. One of the highest scoring left wingers of all time, Steve Shutt thrilled forum fans for 12 seasons. But Steve is quick to credit the Montreal spirit. The ego we had as, as a team was we were the best. And we were going to prove it. And we were going to prove it tonight. And we were going to prove it tomorrow night. And we we're going to prove it the night after that we're the best. And uh, it, it, that attitude becomes um, a habit. And uh, you know, it's a good habit to get into. The 
the Stanley Cup ring it to me is is everything. When you win a championship and you receive the championship ring, you can't put dollars and cents on it or anything. It's just the passion to play to be a winner. It's inspiring in a sense that your fans are there and they're very vocal. They're there, uh, win or lose, your fans are there for you. And that's, that's the Philly fans. But before Bill Barber would make his Philadelphia debut, there was a lot of hockey to be played. In Calendar, Ontario, winter was spent on the ice. And with the Kitchener Rangers, Bill was a junior star. The Flyers' first round pick in the 1972 amateur draft. I was very competitive. Uh, I wanted to win. I wanted to feel good. Uh, I wanted to be part of the action all the time or, or be a part of that winning feeling. And so I had to produce. And produce he did with 30 goals in his rookie campaign. But when assigned power play duties, the left winger had a confession to make. Please understand, I said, I don't know how to play forward on, in the power play. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, I've never played there. I've always played the point. I've, I, I grew up as a defenseman. I came through some of my junior as a defenseman, and I said I play the point on the power play. And uh, they moved me there. They took a gamble, a big gamble, <laughs> and it paid off. And Philadelphia with a man advantage. A pass back to Barber. There's a shot. He had great speed, great hands, great knowledge of the game, but the big key was. He was the guy on the power play. Billy Barber had a, had a really good habit of trying to get under your skin and getting off your game by bumping you, distracting you, yelling at you, talking to you. He, he was a competitor. He, he was always around the net. Um, you, you could never uh, take your eye off him. Billy always used to score on me, Billy Barber. Oh, I used to get mad at him. <laughs> Even if he wasn't in... Billy Barber was the kind of guy in me, if he, if he shot the puck out from the corner, would hit somebody and go in. But he always ends up with a goal or two and, and a big play. Big time player. Big plays at the right time. Philadelphia played an anything to win brand of hockey. And Bill Barber was no exception. Billy Barber became famous when I coached anyway for the dive. He drew penalties till finally the referees said, I don't care if you hook them under the chin. I am not calling a penalty on Barber. This was part of his strategy on the ice. If he was being checked closely, he'd bring the stick of the opposing player into his stomach and dive over it to draw a penalty. And it worked quite a bit of the time, but later in his career, I think the officials were more wise to it. He did make it more dramatic than it needed to be, but that was his way of trying to get the edge. I got away with it, like I said, for a while. I didn't get away with it later. Bill Barber was a very talented individual hockey player. And that aspect of the Flyers game to me has always been forgotten in all of the, the uh, to talk about the rough stuff. The Flyers earned the nickname the Broad Street Bullies, and they lived up to their reputation. They still kind of chuckle about it. Oh, here comes the Broad Street Bullies. There'll be fights here tonight. Uh, yes, we were a tough team, and we competed very, very hard. But on the other hand, too, uh, we had a lot of talent on our hockey team. For two straight years, Bill Barber and the Philadelphia Flyers were Stanley Cup champions. But love them or hate them, the Broad Street Bullies always drew a crowd. They had to like us. They hate us that bad. They had to like us. Deep down, uh, I think they liked our hockey team. <laughs> I could not wait to put that number for in my back with my sweater that I had uh, at Christmas, you know, and just pretend I was Jean Billy on the ice out there. Didn't matter if that was 30 below or 20 below. I mean, it was just uh, you could not get myself and my friend off the ice. I mean, a lot of time was start to be dark, and my dad will come over and just yell at me. It was time to come back home. Growing up in Montreal. Guy Lapointe dreamed of one day playing for the Canadians with his hero, Jean Beliveau. But his first pro club would be far from home in Houston, Texas.
Oh gosh, I'm telling you, that was pretty special for me to go there. I could not speak one word in English. I was homesick and I uh, was thinking about quitting. And uh, so a couple of times, I'll see, I did talk to my dad on the phone and I uh, was telling him, well, dad, I think I'm gonna come back. I don't think I can make the team. But Guy stuck it out. And just one year later, called up by the Canadians, his dream was about to come true. Honestly, I could hardly breathe, and I do remember just kind of a look at Jean Beliveau, and uh, could hardly was able to tie my skate. I mean, I was so nervous. There are players who come along every once in a while, and after about three games in the National League, you don't think they're a rookie anymore. Guy Lapointe, after three or four or five games for the Montreal Canadiens as a rookie, in the early 1970s was just, you just never ever thought of him as a rookie. He just fit in so quickly and played so well right off the bat. The point was a complete player. He was an excellent defenseman in every sense of the word. He could play physically if you had to. He could score the big goals and he often did that too. He's not given enough credit, I don't think, uh, in lines of history for the big goals that he scored. He could probably have played as a forward. In fact, there's no doubt he could have played as a forward as well. If they were down late in the game, he said, Scotty would say, okay, Guy, go. And then that meant that he could take the puck and he could do whatever he wanted with it and almost become a fourth forward, if you will, you know? He could do it. He was that talented uh, offensively as well as defensively. He would block shots. Uh, he would, he, he, he could and would fight. He, he scored goals. He, he would be in front of the other team's net on an offensive play as a defenseman and be, be back in his own zone, ready to pick up his responsibilities there. He was a, he was a great all-round player who played defense. The points inspired performance with the Canadians played a key role in six Stanley Cup victories. On the ice, he was a true competitor. But once the game was over, Guy liked a little fun. Guy Lapointe was the classic, the classic prankster of all time, and still is. Uh, I mean, whenever he's around, you just better be careful. You should never fall asleep on a plane when people like Guy Lapointe are around. And Yvonne Lambert, when he's breaking into the league, made that mistake once, didn't know any better, fell asleep. Uh, when he awoke, naturally, his boots were long gone. I don't know if he ever got his boots back, because I remember him walking through the airport in his stocking feet. But that was only after he had finished taking off the pile of whipped cream topped with a cherry that was on top of his head when he woke up. Pierre Trudeau was at a game one night in Montreal when he was the Prime Minister, and after the game, uh, he wanted to go in the Canadian's dressing room and shake hands with all the players, which he did. And when it came time to shake hands with Guy Lapointe, Lapointe, priming himself for the moment of shaking hands with the Prime Minister, had put Vaseline on his right hand. So Trudeau was going down the line, and he got to this one guy, and I guess he kept going, but he must have wondered what the heck was that all about. But that was Guy. I did start, like, kind of make, uh, play some trick before, and, uh starting a game like in the dressing room and that was a way for me to relax and make my teammate relax and Guy Lapointe was the kind of guy that made it fun to be on a team and he had a, a, a large impact on on the Canadians in that way as that person who made a team feel like a team and made a team want to be a team As a young kid uh, back home, it was only three things uh, that really matter: it was politics, religion, and hockey. And for me, hockey came first. You grew up uh, thinking about hockey to, uh, all day and played hockey uh, all day when you could. Uh, and in those days, you did not want to play for any other team but the Montreal Canadiens. A strapping six foot three, two hundred and ten pound blue liner. Serge Savard stuck to his goal, and in 1967 made it onto the ice at the Montreal Forum with his boyhood hero. It was a great thrill, especially uh, playing with John Bellevue on the same ice, traveling with him to the airport because he was living in my hometown in Longueuil. Uh, and uh, sure, that was a great thrill, and winning the Stanley Cup the first year. On top of that, you don't, you can't ask much more. But it got even better. The following season, the Stanley Cup stayed in Montreal, 
and Savard was named the playoffs most valuable player. But two seasons later, serious injuries would plague the rushing defenseman. Well, the first time I broke my legs in five different places, and I had three operations in the same week. So a lot of people said uh, at that time that uh, when my career was in danger, and uh, but I never crossed my mind that my career was in danger. When I came back after all those injuries, uh, I think I, I became a more defensive, a more stay-home defenseman, and I really enjoy it. I played with Larry. Uh, most of my career after he came with us. And uh, I say, you go ahead. Don't worry about what's happening in the back. I played seven years with Serge, and, you know, I made a lot of mistakes when we first started playing together, but Serge always covered up for me. The, the big three were the essence of the Montreal dynasty, the so-called big three on defense. There was Savard, Larry Robinson, and Guy Lapointe. And those three held the whole defense together. And it was Serge Savard who held those three together. He was also a true leader for the Canadian. He was the defenseman that the Scotty Bowman was looking for when the game was on the line, when the series was on the line, when the championships wasn't the line. He had a lot of endurance. He could play uh, 40 minutes in a game, but I think it was because the way he didn't uh, use any unnecessary energy, you know, he would only make rushes at times when he felt there was a real opportunity to, to go with the puck. His strong suit, though, was how um, he played pretty well errorless defense. He'd always make that little spin move, and he'd, he'd come into the corner, and he'd suck two guys onto him, and then he'd make a little spin move, and I knew that, and I'd start to skate across, and he'd just dish it off to me, and then I'd take off up the ice. The, the checker knew that he would do his spin. Uh, they knew in which direction he would spin, and it was as if Serge you know, wanted, to, you know, wanted it that way. He'd be like the fastball pitcher uh, against the fastball hitter and saying, you know what it's going to be? Now hit it. When I did the spinorama, I was not skating. I was stand still at the blue line, and an opponent would come to you, and I would spin real quick. And it's, it's, it's timing, and the other guy didn't have time to turn. Players knew I was going to do it, and they couldn't do it. They couldn't catch me. I've never ever seen a guy like Serge before. It, Never got nervous, never got nervous about anything, and just sit there, have everything analyzed, and just knew exactly what to do. Like, I don't think the word panic exists in his vocabulary. And he was able to keep that kind of composure uh, even when the play uh, or the, uh, the stakes went higher. And that's what really stood out to me about Serge, was his ability to, to stay on course while things were flying out of control around him, he got steadier and stronger and bigger and better. I was always confident of winning. You know, for me, uh, losing was not acceptable. And, and, and when you're in the middle of the action, then you don't think about those things. You don't think about losing. You just think about winning. Most fun in, in the game is winning. And uh, nobody can achieve that on their own. Uh, if you play for a team and you break all the records and the team doesn't win, uh, it's no fun. But the team did win. Savard would raise the Stanley Cup eight times as a player and twice as the Canadiens' general manager. Well, we always... Uh wanted to be a hockey player as long as I could remember. And uh, the way to become a hockey player is to practice. And it was a daily routine. Every day after school or on Saturdays and Sundays, we lived at the rinks. We used to put the Tony's goaltending equipment on the toboggan and my stuff on the thing and walk to the rink. And put the stuff on and then put it on it. Pull the toboggan home again. You have your fun, and then eventually you become better in one position. A lot of guys uh, were afraid to go in the net because there was no face masks. 
You know, I just seemed to excel at it. My brother wasn't sure he wanted to play hockey. I don't think. Um, because when he went to college, and he had a chance to go to junior, but he decided to go to college, but he became an All-American. He was awesome at the college level, absolutely awesome. I had a successful career in college, got a degree, Bachelor of Science in Business. So I said, I'll, you know, I'll try pro and see what happens. I'll give it three years, see what I can do. But it wouldn't take three years. After two seasons of minor pro in Houston and Vancouver, Tony got the call from the Montreal Canadiens. Ironically, his first start would be against the Boston Bruins and brother Phil. After a 2-2 tie, Phil spoke to their mother. Well, well, how'd he do? I said he did fantastic. It was a 2-2 tie, and Tony was outstanding. It was second star tonight. Really? Oh, terrific. Oh, great. Who scored the first goal against him? I said, well, I got that. I scored the first goal against Tony. Who scored the second one? I said, well, I got that one too. How could you do that to your brother, you dirty so-and-so? How could you do that? You're gonna kill his career. I said, relax, he was fine. At the end of a very short period, wearing the Canadian sweater, he was gone. I've always wondered why the Canadians sent him to Chicago. He was clearly better than the goaltenders who were still in Montreal. And I'm quite sure that Canadian's management itself, who made the decision to send Tony to Chicago, perhaps asked themselves that very same question. Why did we send this guy to Chicago? Why didn't we keep this guy? Whatever the reason, Tony was on his way to Chicago and a rookie of the year season with 15 shutouts and an acrobatic style all his own. I mean, talk about teasing the shooter. Here, I'm going to give you about six feet between my legs. You're going to have to go there, and I'm going to shut it down before you even come close to getting it there. Antonio was excellent and close. You know, you'd, you'd, you'd think the way he went down, he'd be vulnerable for the shots up top. But he, you know, he, he was always in the right position, it seemed. Very difficult guy to beat, even though you thought, hmm, you know, he's going down, maybe I'll throw it here. He, it, it didn't happen. I could never beat Tony one-on-one. -on -one. Never. Not one-on-one. -on -one. He was too quick. He had great reflexes. Tony O was a favorite of the Chicago fans. With three Vezina trophies and three first-team All-Star selections, his skill was never in doubt. But Tony wasn't taking any chances. I remember he, he tried every trick in the book to win all the time. He was the very first guy to take the snow and pile it beside the the posts all the time. After a while, it was so high, it was so obvious, so they had to kick it away. He's the guy who got the big glove. He, he tried all the different things, the bigger sweater to catch the puck. He had every angle figured the whole way, and that, that's the way he played. I used to have extra wide pads, but who didn't? But I'd uh, stuff them myself. I did everything. They check them, and I'd take the stuffing out. When they leave, I'd put the stuffing back in. They caught up to me on that one, too, so <laughs> I ran out of ideas. Nowadays, you don't think the goaltenders cheat? Oh, look at the size of their gloves. God, their pads are like three inches wider than what my brother wore. All the great goaltenders are innovators of some sort, even if it was a little against the rules at the time. But it was more than oversized equipment that gave Tony his edge. It was intensity. I wanted to play every game because I liked that, that edge, that competitive edge that you get only from playing. And I wanted to be successful and I wanted to endure and I wanted to set records. I wanted all of those things. Tony's very intense. When he came to the game, it was no talking to him, miserable, pop, 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 pop. There was no, there was no messing around before. The locker room was all business. And if you try to talk to him, it was like, get away from me. I don't want to talk to you, get away from me. Everybody thinks you're calm. <laughs> you're not calm, at least I wasn't. You're a nervous wreck. I'm not the kind of guy that could, you know, have a bad game and then say, well, it's just a game. I never was. I 
matter what you do, some days the puck goes in. <laughs> it just happens. Tony retired in 1984, but to this day, he has never really left the game. When that national anthem comes on, even today, I think about when I'm getting ready for a hockey game. Isn't that amazing? That the, all those years of hearing that national anthem, that it just makes me sweat. Even today at an event, even though I'm not participating, I get nervous. <laughs> One year we watched the draft and we see the Montreal Canadian selecting a 22 goal scorer in the first round. It was almost panic at the Forum in Montreal. A 22-goal scorer in the first round. Nobody believed it. A pass up on the left wing. It's taken by Ganey. Ganey dodges a check at his line. Johnson in behind the goal. Right up front. They shoot. They score! Some sloppy defensive work. And Ganey came whistling in to make it 5-2. Ontario. There is more to the game of hockey than scoring goals and the keen eye of Montreal's legendary general manager, Sam Pollock, saw the potential in a young Peterborough player. Well, the drafting of Bob Ganey uh, as the Montreal Canadiens' number one pick was typical Sam Pollock. I mean, he knew. We didn't know. I'm sure that somebody like Sam Pollock wasn't the least bit surprised that Bob Ganey turned out to be Bob Ganey. It was a surprise to me, and, and I think a surprise to most of the people at that time. I was drafted higher in the draft than I had been uh, slotted and uh, to Montreal who was a, a strong team at the time it won the Stanley Cup the previous spring or that spring and really didn't look like they needed a lot of help but away I went anyway uh, the first year was really a, a hazy misty kind of experience where there was so much to learn and uh, and the season passed along quickly and and I did absorb a lot uh, but uh, really wasn't effective as a, as a player and uh, sometime during the following off season, our invitation letter to the training camp for the following year simply stated that our goal was to win the Stanley Cup, that we had failed the year before, and that uh, there was nothing else in between. The Montreal Canadiens' dedication to winning was a perfect match for Bob Ganey, as he perfected the demanding role of defensive forward. Bob Ganey was a was a terrific skater, this wonderful all-round player. Um, on the Canadians, you knew you could score goals. Uh, what you also needed to be able to do was to shut down the best on the other side. And, and shut them down, not just to prevent them from scoring, but, but to defeat them. Well, Bob Gaines became an important player because we we had him on a, on a top line for stopping the other team's uh, best players. So he had a tough assignment every night. He generally had to play against the other team's best right winger. And uh, he didn't think it was that tough in his own mind. He took away a lot of your ice. Uh, when you pick the puck up, you're looking at Bob Ganey on the ice. Uh, and usually he was in front of you. That's a sign of a good checker. He wasn't chasing you. <laughs> you had to go through him. If you play against him, it's one thing you will find out, he never quit. Bob Guinea was probably the, the best defensive forward ever played a game. I like to play a physical style. I like to bump into people. I like to bump people from the puck and, and recover the puck. And I had size and I had speed and I had balance on my skates. and, and I enjoyed it because it was something that I was good at. Bob Ganey I mean, knew exactly what he needed to do. When he he'd get the big hit in early, it made you realize that, boy, it was going to be a long, hard night. You know, you, you talk about the Soviet coach that said that this is the greatest player in the world. And this is not a goaltender or a high-scoring defenseman or someone that's going to get 120 points. This is a 50-point man who is the greatest player in the world, according to the Soviets, who love 
the brilliance of the way the game is supposed to be played. It was kind of interesting because he, you know, he made the defensive game really come to light. Um, I mean, when people saw Bob Gainey, they'd watch Bob Gainey because they, they knew that this was a defensive player. And I think that's one of the very first times that people would really come and watch a defensive player. He was so good, he was so intense that the league had to create a trophy to honor players of his caliber, a defensive form. From its inception, the Frank Selke Trophy would bear Bob Ganey's name for four consecutive years. A leader on the ice, Ganey would be named captain of the Montreal Canadiens in 1981. Winning the Stanley Cup and holding it up is, is fabulous, but it's the day-to-day -day work that goes in to get you there that makes holding it up so much fun. He's not a guy that goes into something and does it half-heartedly. Whatever he does, he does it to the best of his ability, and, and he gives it everything that he has. And he's sweeping around the net, leading an attack from Canadians to center. And there's Ganey going after it in the Islanders zone. He rolled it in front, he scores! Ganey, seven seconds into the first period. There's a lot of respect and a lot of uh, responsibility attached to being the captain in Montreal. And uh, um, so it, it was an honor, but it was a responsibility. And uh, um, I mean, it, it's one of those things that uh, has happened in my life as things uh, come up and I run into them. I very seldom say no. He's very well spoken, very well respected, um, probably looked up to by more of players and ex-players and anybody that, that I've ever played with. Ganey would win five Stanley Cups, the last coming in 1986. Three years later, he would step from the ice to the front office to continue his winning ways. I'm still at it, and I'm still at it because I love it, because I, I like the competition. And, uh, I understand the ground, I understand the turf, and uh, it feels good. My dream was to play hockey ever since I was eight years old and was asked by a guidance counselor what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I said, play hockey. I want to try it out and I'll never forget this. I skated around three times this way, three times the other way with a ton of guys and they went, you, 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 go sit over there. And I was one of those guys. And we just sat there. And at the end of the practice, he came to us and said, I'm sorry, boys, you didn't make it. And I'll never forget it. I was 11 or 12. And I said, then why'd you make us sit here? Typical me. Richard, facing off Failure to make a bantam hockey team wasn't about to stop Phil Esposito. Phil would make it all the way to the NHL and the Chicago Blackhawks. But after four seasons, he would be traded to Boston. The Chicago Blackhawks have to wonder if that wasn't the worst trade they ever made. He just he just turned us into a into a Stanley Cup winner. That's all. That was a great trade for us. When Phil arrived in Boston, they hadn't made the playoffs for eight seasons, but Esposito and Bobby Orr changed all that. In 1970, the Bruins won their first cup in 29 years, and in '72, Phil would hold the cup again. When I got in the dressing room and we passed it around and. I remember grabbing it, and putting my arms around it, and I remember kissing it. And you could feel, I don't know, it's hard to explain, man. It, you, the vibes were there, there's no doubt about it. All those names on there, and that's very, I'm very proud of that. The very first time I saw Phil, he had gold beads around here, he had the long hair. I said, this guy's a movie actor, he can't, nobody could be that good. I think Phil Esposito probably was ahead of his time in that he was so big. A lot of players now are big, but when Phil Esposito played, uh, he had that strength and that ability uh, to stand in front of the net and that Boston Bruin power play. Everybody in the stadium knew what they were gonna do, and yet you couldn't stop it. Sooner or later, it comes to the slot. Sooner or later, in every time, almost every shift, that you're down in the other opponent's zone, it comes to the slot in the front of the net. It always does. 
And once I planted my feet in my big butt and my 218 pounds of, of uh, solid fat, they, they couldn't move this dude. And, uh, and I wouldn't let him move me. And there were some guys that did some dirty things, and I took a lot of beating there. And people said, how could you take it? Well, I've learned very early in my career that they pay guys at score. Mr. Slot. It's the only word that can describe Phil Esposito. The strongest individual ever to play in the slot and play it so well. Phil had very, very good hands and was he was a big guy. He was a tough guy to push around. Even if you push him, you couldn't move him much. I never had a real good hard shot, but it was a very, very accurate shot, and I could get it away as quickly as anybody in hockey. Um, and that was my, my claim to fame. When the puck hit the back of the net, I could hear it. It was almost obscene, you know what I mean? But I could hear it. I could hear the crowd cheering. I could hear the puck hit the back of the net. He was a, as natural a goal scorer as I've ever seen. He'd play four and five minutes straight. His coaches, I know Don Cherry's mentioned a number of times that he'd play right through the six wingers. He'd play through his line, they changed. He'd play through the next center's line, they changed. He'd play through the next center's line. Well, Phil would stay on if he didn't have a hook. You wouldn't get him off the ice. And he'd stay on till the whistle went, and he'd go to the face-off. He wouldn't come off the ice. We played with three lines, four defensemen, and one goalie. And now they play with four lines, six defensemen, and two goalies. And they only played 40, 35, 40 second shifts. Man, I was just getting warmed up in 35 or 40 seconds. That's why I don't know whether I could play in this day and age. I don't think I could play in this day and age, but I love to dream about it. The 1972 Summit Series was arguably Phil Esposito's finest hour. Arriving in Moscow, Team Canada had their backs to the wall, and for Esposito, things got off to an ominous start. I was so nervous that I guess one of the kids dropped a little stem of the flower because these little girls came out and presented us all with a little flower. And so when they presented, when they said to me, I skated up and don't I step on that little stem like this and whoop, pow, right on my butt, right? And I laugh it. I'm standing and I'm looking. And as I get up and bow, I look up and I made eye contact like you can't believe. And we've all been there. I made eye contact, you know? Great eye contact with Brezhnev. You know, with the eyebrows. And people don't see this in the tape. As I bent down to pick up the floor, and I got up and I went. And the guy beside him started laughing, and Brezhnev looked at him. And the guy stopped. Pass right in front of him. It was no laughing matter for the Soviets, as Phil would lead Team Canada to a hard fought victory in what is regarded as hockey's greatest triumph. It was a war. It was a war for me. It, it was not a game. It was a war, and I've said this publicly before, I often wonder how somebody could kill another person. But there's no doubt in my mind I would have killed them to win. The NHL had never seen a goal scorer like Phil Esposito. With Boston, he went five times win the scoring championship and twice be named league MVP. But on a Bruins road trip, Phil got a visit from the coach. Don Cherry walked in with the ugliest pajamas I ever saw, and Bobby Orr was in a T-shirt and a pair of shorts. And Bobby went over to the window, and um, he's looking out the window, and I was sitting at the edge of the bed. And I'm in my underwear, and I'm sitting at the edge of the bed. And Don says, Phil, you, you, you've been traded. I want I know. But if you tell me New York, I'm going to jump out that window. He says, Bobby, Open the window. The New York Rangers would be the last team in Phil Esposito's 18-year career. It was hard work, but it was worth it. People are so amazed when I say that I worked in the summertime until I was 30 years old. 30. Nowadays, they're retiring at 30. Until I was 30 years old, I went home in Sault Ste. Marie and worked in the steel mill, I'll go with contractors, until I was 30 years old just to make ends meet. Why? Because we love the game. We love to play. I mean, most of us played for nothing. My old man one time said, 
my son would play for nothing. And I'll never forget that summer when I went home and I said, Dad, you're right. And I have played for nothing, so I need to borrow some money. Kate Smith was really an incredible phenomenon of, at that time, and uh, and the Flyers, you know, had that, you know, had the record there of, of what, would they play Kate Smith? Would they play the Star Spangled Banner? Uh, they were winning almost all the time with Kate Smith. The fans would start chanting, you know, uh, play Kate, play Kate, or, you know, and play Kate to win. And they had a, you know, standing record that they'd put up on a, you know, on a board. And, 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 uh, uh, and, and it was, it was hugely exciting. We were playing the Flyers in the 76 finals, and we won the first two games in Montreal, and we were going back to Philadelphia. And Kate Smith had appeared live the previous year when the when the Flyers had won the Stanley Cup, and and so the speculation almost from the moment that the second game ended was, you think Kate's going to be there? Do you think Kate's going to be there? And uh, and these are you know this is speculation amongst players that don't speculate about anthem singers and uh, and much less know uh, much if anything about uh, God bless America and uh, and and that was the talk and the talk continued in the off day and it continued on the the day of the game and it continued into the dressing room before uh, the third game and it and it continued you know uh, you know through the warm-up and into the dressing room before the start of the game and and we skated out onto the ice and uh in that kind of ritual skate before the anthem is, is going to be played and uh and we line up on 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 the blue line and i'm standing there and i'm standing beside jimmy roberts and jimmy roberts was a a veteran uh, at that point, he had played in every situation. He had seen it all. He had done it all. There was nothing that could get to Jimmy. Well, all of a sudden, the end, you know, it's, it's a blackened arena. The end boards open up. The red carpet rolls out. And here is this figure that starts towards us, and it's Kate Smith. And the spotlight finds her, and she starts into God Bless America. And I look, I mean, I, and Jimmy Roberts behind, beside me, he is belting out God Bless America. I'm belting out God Bless America. I mean, it was an incredible moment. The, the, the arena was just electrified. And, and when the anthem ended, and I mean, you know, typically what happens is the players kind of then go back into a ritual skate. Well, it was like, you know, uh, 19 players were in the starting blocks uh, on the blue line, and they just shot off the blue line with, with the energy of the building and of Kate Smith's God Bless America. Well, we beat them, and, and it was great. And the Flyers were the only team in the league that I hated. You know, the others, um, I had a certain feeling for the Flyers I hated. And, and, and it was just doubly terrific to beat them. Well, now we're facing the fourth game where we could possibly win. And, and, and you know, I thought on the daily, well, you know, our guys don't know God Bless America. They, they, they're, they're sitting you know, along the line, they're singing it, but they don't know the words. Maybe I could write out the words to God Bless America copy it up 25 times and then we'd have it in case we won but geez then you know if we lose then I've got these 25 
pieces of God bless America and the kind of irony of preparing for victory when you shouldn't be preparing and you should only be thinking about the game ahead and uh, and the irony of that and the embarrassment of it and somebody will probably find out about it and the humiliation that could follow and then they could still come back three games to one three two three three win the series and 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 the fact that I was counting my chickens before you know they were hatching there you know you just don't do that I don't dare do it uh, maybe I will so I did it I had them and 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 we played that fourth game and we beat them and we beat them right in Philadelphia and the celebrations are going on in the dressing room and I reach sort of back into my case and where they were hidden and nobody could see them bring them out and handed out the song sheets around the room and we sang God Bless America and we uh, you know and on the bus out to the airport we were singing God Bless America and on the charter back to Montreal you know from beginning to end it was singing God Bless America until Roger Doucette who was the anthem singer you know in Montreal and the greatest of all the anthem singers decided that he would you know and he was singing along with us and he decided he would start singing God Bless Our Canada and so it was versions of a God Bless Our Canada to the tune of God Bless America. My dream was to play hockey ever since I was eight years old and was asked by a guidance counselor what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I said, play hockey. And she got peed at me and I had my dad come over and everything else. And I'll never forget this. I loved my dad for this. She, he looked at her and said, well, what's wrong with playing hockey? She said, well, the other kids want to be doctors and lawyers and nurses. I said, so? My father said, if he wants to play hockey, what's wrong with that? I never wanted to do anything else. And all the things I did was a bonus. Just playing was the fun. It was April 3rd that I got hit. April 6th, they operated on me. And they came and got me April... No, excuse me, April 4th, they operated on me. April 6th, they came and got me for the wind-up party. I came out of surgery, and I can remember this. I was still groggy, but I'd be waking up, looking at the game, and falling back to sleep. Waking up and looking at the game. They were playing the Rangers. It was a 1-1 series tie. Greg Shepard took my place, and we lost, we lost the game, so they were out. So the guys came back, and the next day they came in to see me, and they told me that um, they were going to come and get me for the wind-up party. I said, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And I had a cast on from my groin to my toes. In those days, that's what they did. And Bobby said, no, we're coming to get you, Wapa. We're coming to get you for the party. I said, come on, Bob, what am I going to He says, no, nah, don't worry about it. You're coming. I said, yeah, sure. My wife was like, she was panicking, you know. And, um, uh, and I said, nah, don't worry about it. I'm not going to go anywhere. That night, about 7.30, the door slams open. And there's Bobby Orr dressed in a hospital gown and a mask and a hat. And guys were all around. And he says, we're getting, taking you. And I was right across the room. I was in Phillips House, I believe it was 611. I was right in that, and I was right across the, from the elevator. They wheel me in, I says, and the elevator guy's in there, and there's, it was a little black guy, and he was laughing, he had a grin from year to year. And I later found out Bobby gave him like 40 bucks, and he had, a, he had a private detective go up to the nurse's desk, show the badge and say, Where, where's the guy that got shot? Now, if there's a shooting, nurses are going to get panicky. And they were looking around, and so they didn't see me go. So they get me in the elevator and take me to the basement of the Mass General, and they put the sheet up over my head. And my leg's up in traction now, you got to understand. And that's all I have on is a hospital, Johnny. And we're going down the hallway, and I could hear people going, that's Bobby Orr. And he's saying, emergency, emergency, out of the way. And they're wheeling the bed. Now, they get to the doorway. And the door, there's electric doors where you step, and they open up. But they got the bar. So Dallas Smith, I believe, Kenny Hodge and Bobby, they start shaking a guy named Patty Considine. They do this and they rip it right out of the cement. Now the door's open and they can wheel me down Cambridge Street to the place called the Branding Iron, which was Bobby's, uh, he owned this bar. They get me to the foot of the stairs because it was up about 
20, 20 flight, 20 stairs, and they broke the wheel. So now they got to carry the bed. They carry it up and they put it in the middle of the bar and they got it some bricks, put it under where the wheel was broken, and they put this stinky provolone cheese in my lap. And now you got to understand, my leg's still up straight up. And I had a beer in this hand and a beer in that hand. They said, okay, the party begins. And next thing I know, the television that comes on TV, Felicito kidnapped out of the Mass General. Bobby called Dr. Rowe and he said, look, we got him, don't worry, everything's fine. And Dr. Rowe said, I'll send an ambulance for him. And Bobby said, no, we took him here, we'll take him back in a half an hour. Well, they had to carry that bed all the way back. And it cost 750 bucks to fix that bed and that door, and I paid. And Bobby called me the next day and he says, what a party, huh? I said, fantastic. And he said, did you pay for the damage? I said, yeah. He said, good party, wasn't it, Phil? 